Hello and welcome to our first briefing room of the year. I'm Michaela Morris, Head of Program Delivery at ClimateWorks Center. Today we'll be looking at findings from ClimateWorks Renovation Pathways Project. The work sheds light on how homes in Australia perform in energy measures and what combinations of exterior upgrades and electrification are needed to get them climate ready. But first, let's begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from which each of us is dialing in today. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I also extend my respect to any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders joining us today. Please feel free to use the chat to tell us where you're dialing in from. Over the next hour, you will hear from three speakers who worked at, on the Renovation Pathways project. First up, Dr. Jill Armstrong will introduce the project and share how thermal upgrades can lead to major energy and emission savings. Then I'll be speaking with Michael Amrose, our research partner from CSIRO, to hear more about the details of the analysis and what led him and the agency to this work. Finally, we'll hear from Josh Danahay, who will do a deep dive into the findings and will be taking us on a state-by-state -state tour of how we all can benefit from making our homes climate ready. A reminder, we'll be taking your questions a little later on, but please submit them anytime via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. All right, let's kick us off with our first speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce you all to my colleague, Dr. Jill Armstrong, who leads our building's work at ClimateWorks, including the Renovation Pathways Project. Working in the city's team, Jill leads research and policy projects to decarbonize Australia's building sector, including residential and non-residential building, um, and both new and existing builds. She has more than 10 years of experience as a registered architect and a chartered architectural technologist, specializing in adaptive reuse of residential and healthcare buildings. Jill has also a background in research, earning her PhD in the adaptive reuse and regulation of vacant office buildings in Australia's CBDs. Over to you, Jill. Please tell us about the Renovation Pathways work. Thanks, Michaela. It's a real pleasure today to share that context for the project. Now, Australia's homes make up around 10% of the country's emissions, and they use around 24% of Australia's electricity. And we know that from our most recent modelling that improving energy efficiency in housing and electrifying high energy appliances is really important as an action to decarbonize Australia's economy in line with the Paris Agreement temperature goals. Now, our model shows that it is possible to reduce 41% of the residential building emissions. And from those 11 million homes in Australia, which were mostly built before the country introduced energy efficiency standards around early 2000s, it's neither possible to demolish and rebuild um, all inefficient homes. So we know that the answer is in retrofitting as well. And the best time to retrofit homes are when homes are undergoing wider renovations, hence the title of the Project Renovation Pathways. Now, homes are meant to be our dooners in winter. They're meant to be our oasis in summer keeping us safe from harsh weather events. And people in homes, particularly homes built before the early 2000s, they know all too well that their spaces are getting too hot in summer and too cold in winter. And curiously, we have normalized advice in Australia to combat poor housing. For example, we are advising to wear outdoor clothing indoors in winter, such as thick parkas, woolly hats, or to seek refuge from heat waves by going shopping to shopping malls or libraries uh, to keep cool, when really our homes should be doing that safe shelter in any temperature. So one of the issues that we've got is that our homes are really leaky. This means that air easily enters and leaves our homes and the cool and warmth that we pump into our houses to counteract the weather is easily, it's too easy for that to escape. And it's a bit like keeping the fridge freezer door slightly ajar. We're spending energy to keep things at a safer temperature. If the door's ajar, the temperature is lost quickly. So whilst energy used to be cheap, 
we are all now facing a cost of living crisis and the cost of having an inefficient home is impacting more and more people. So from the research, we know as well that the most vulnerable members of our communities are in the worst performing homes. And the costs of in inefficient homes are showing up in our energy bills, in our health outcomes and in our family's comfort. Now, inefficient homes aren't just burdensome for occupants, and they also really pose a significant extra cost for all of us, and we call these societal costs. With millions of energy inefficient homes connected to the grid, the size and the cost of the infrastructure needed to decarbonize our energy system is going to be large. Our energy infrastructure needs to be sized to meet the peak demand, which is often when solar is not generating and everyone is at home using all appliances. But if we improve our energy efficiency, we can reduce the peak demand and reduce the societal costs of the infrastructure needed. So the urgency is real and we need to improve home energy efficiency to, to reduce emissions and mitigate climate harms, to reduce our peak demand for a least cost transition to a renewable energy grid and also to support people's health through safe and comfortable homes without huge energy bills. Now, over in the past year, Renovation Pathways team has been collaborating with research partners CSIRO and SPR, Strategy Policy Research, as well as our expert advisory group of over 20 organizations to identify and sense check the most cost-effective ways to upgrade home energy performance. Now, before we embarked on the project, we interviewed many stakeholders um, and a few of these are listed here on this slide. We asked them all, what is preventing a renovation, re, uh, renovation wave from happening in Australia uh, as it has done it in other countries? What's stopping us here? And so from those interviews, it was clear that there is a knowledge gap to understand our residential existing building stock and also how to apply tried and tested energy efficient upgrades to this stock. And these were the gaps that we found. First, there was no accessible, easy to digest description of what a good net zero carbon home looks like in Australia. So we drafted a short accessible definition to in better inform home renovations. And second, there was no clear picture of what our national housing stock looks like and subsequently what can be done to improve all Australian homes. And we were convinced if we filled these two gaps, the knowledge could guide banks, insurers and policymakers to develop the help needed to support home upgrades at scale. Now, through our analysis, we were able to show what the housing stock actually looks like, what the most common types of homes are, and define clear upgrade packages, including how much they cost and how much, how much each home can save. And so modeling these packages, we now have the evidence for where policy can make the biggest impact across Australia's 69 different climate zones. So what does the Australian housing stock look like as a national picture? And before Michael unpacks some of the detail around the data, I'll share this preview. The vast majority of Australian houses are indeed detached or freestanding homes. Now, detached homes make up around 71% of our housing stock nationally, and apartments make up around 16%, and townhouses make up a further 13%. And if we can zoom in even further, you can even see the distribution of 16 of the most common types or archetypes of homes in Australia, and these are represented by the different shades in each of the bars on the chart. Now, we have five archetypes for detached dwellings and six for townhouses. And these together, these 11 archetypes make up around 80% of the detached homes and townhouses in our stock. And for the five apartment archetypes, these represent around 50% of the apartment stock. And if we zoom in even further, we can understand what these dwellings are made of. Two of the most prevalent archetypes for detached dwellings have lightweight walls, 
timber or render or brick veneer. We have framed roofs and they have either a ground floor of a concrete slab or they have suspended timber floors. And I'm sure these two houses on the screen here will look really familiar to you. They are everywhere. Um, and as we have been going along the project, I've been sense checking the archetypes at my local pub. And so far, I haven't met anyone at the pub who does not live in a home that is not covered by our archetypes. So homes uh, with concrete floors make up around 30% of the total housing stock for detached dwellings, while homes with suspended timber floors um, make up around 15%. Now, the bad news is if you live in one of these two homes, that these are typically the worst performing. But the great news is, is that upgrading them, you will see a huge difference. And it's a significant opportunity for household wallets, emission reductions and feeling that extra comfort. And this is just a taste of the insights that we've been able to draw out of the data. And you'll next hear from Michael and Josh about how we hope to turn this into meaningful action across Australia. Back to you, Michaela. Thank you, Jill. Um, I think many of us can relate to feeling too hot or too cold inside of our houses. Um, I grew up in Europe. I've never been colder in winter inside or hotter in summer inside than I am in Australia. Um, and I also found that your point about peak energy amount is often overlooked. This challenge is obviously not just about um, home comfort and reducing energy bills, but it's also about ensuring an orderly transition of our energy system. Um, overall, there doesn't seem to be many downsides to this renovation wave. And what you've been describing is really a quadruple win. So quadruple win by renovating less emissions, more cost savings, less demand for costly energy infrastructure and gains in health and comfort. Now, if you have any questions about anything you've just heard, please don't forget to submit those in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Michael Ambrose. Michael is a senior experimental scientist at the Energy Business Unit at CSIRO. He leads buildings projects for industry and the Australian government, involving energy efficiency, life cycle analysis, and sustainable urban development. He's also a prolific author on energy efficient buildings and urban sustainability. Michael was instrumental in demystifying Australia's housing stock. And he's here today to shed some light on how this was achieved and to share some of his experience. Welcome, Michael. It's great to have you here with us. Good idea, Michaela. Pleasure. Um, so, Michael, you're not only a senior experimental scientist and author, you're also a trained architect. So I'm sure this gives you a wealth of knowledge and hands-on experience, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you today. Um, let's start with what you see as the big problems with Australians' housing stock. Yeah, sure. Um, and yes, I did do architecture. It's a long, long time ago since I did, archi I did architecture, but it, it does give you that sort of unique insight in, uh, from a scientific perspective uh, about the issues that we've got with our existing stock. So most of our homes uh, were built well before we had any form of energy efficiency requirements uh, in our building codes. Uh, in fact, we estimate that it's around about 80% of homes uh, in Australia are, are in this group where there was no regulation. This means that when it comes to energy efficiency, most of our homes are terrible, just like you said, Michaela, people that have come from uh, countries where they've had energy efficiency as part of their home building for many years, have never experienced such cold homes uh, as, as we have here. And as Jill mentioned, so we have these, these homes that are hot in summer and cold in winter, and they're very, very drafty. And indeed, other research we've done, we've got some of the leakiest homes uh, in the world. And what, of course, this leads to is homes that are expensive to keep comfortable, requiring lots of energy to heat and cool our homes. Yeah, fascinating. Can you tell us um, a bit more about the, some of the other work you've been involved in leading up to this project? Yeah, sure. Uh, so one of the issues that we have is we really don't have uh, a good understanding of what our housing stock, the actual overall housing stock uh, looks like. And what homes are out there, how are they distributed. What we do know well is what we currently build. So CSIRO has been collecting data from energy rating certificates that are required for every new build that we do. And we've been collecting that since about 2016. And this gives us a really good profile of what the new homes look like. In fact, we've got over 1.3 million homes in our database uh, now. 
So we thought, could we use this database to create a pseudo database of existing homes? And that's, this would allow us to carry out the modeling scenarios that we've been able to do for, for new home stock. So as part of the work we did with, uh, with RMIT as part of the Race 2030 uh, projects, uh, we took around 200,000 homes, uh, new homes from our, our database and we degraded them uh, thermally. So by that, I mean, we removed all the insulation, we downgraded their windows, we made them leakier, uh, and then we re-ran them through our modeling software to see how they, uh, they performed. Uh, the result was we got a set of houses that rated around about one to two stars. And that's where we believe the existing stock roughly sits. So this gave us a really good basis of, of a pseudo, this pseudo existing home database that we could use for stock modeling work. Okay, and why did CSIRO become involved in renovation pathways thereafter? Yeah, well, one of the exciting aspects of the renovation pathways project was to try and establish that distribution of housing archetypes throughout Australia. So we sort of established, yes, we'd, we'd got the models of these existing homes there, but we didn't know what the distribution looked like. So our work with RIT had been great at creating a set of designs that we could use to improve its performance, but we had no feel for how these designs were actually distributed uh, across Australia. So, so determining what are the dominant archetypes, where, uh, where and how they distributed was really an exciting aspect. Uh, once we established that, we were able to run upgrade scenarios, uh, assign cost estimates to those, to those scenarios, and establish a really solid base what are the cost-effective options for improving the energy performance of this 80% of the dwellings that are out there that have had no or only very limited uh, thermal improvements done, done to them. Mm -hmm. um, and now about the role of CSIRO, so what have, have the agent contributed to this project so far? So our, our main role is to further develop and enhance that, that pseudo existing homes database that we created as part of the RMIT study. We had to start clustering these designs together. We had it in our database into, into these design archetypes and then help to establish how these were distributed. And as you can imagine, we had vast amounts of data that we were dealing with and, and often it can be difficult to see uh, the proverbial wood through the trees uh, when we've got so much data to deal with. So I'm a big believer in using data visualization, not only to present findings to a wider audience, but also it's a very effective research and analysis tool. So I took up, did a lot of the visualization of the data to help the help in the analysis process. We were also able to undertake some additional thermal modeling runs as we narrowed down our designs into the final set of design archetypes and determined the upgrade pathways we, we wanted to, to undertake on those archetypes and the various climate zones around Australia. And in the end, that led us to having a very powerful set of modeled results that could then be used to undertake the cost and the climate impact estimates. Thank you. I think we can all relate to that data in itself doesn't really tell us a story um, <laughs> or the implementation and the visualization. Um, and once you've done that, so what did you learn about Australia's housing stock? I think what I was excited to see uh, most of was the almost immediate impact that could be achieved to undertaking the thermal improvements of our existing homes, it's especially those simpler improvements, not rather than the full, full on, fully blown uh, ones. These simpler improvements that are easier and cheaper to undertake, the, the performance improvements that have been achieved were significant. And really, the cost benefits were also really impressive. And, and the payback periods for those simpler improvements were also quick, really quick. So it showed that undertaking such improvements is one of the most cost effective ways to improve the thermal performance of our homes and lower our energy bills and, and of course help us put us on this whole trajectory we have to achieving zero emission homes. Brilliant. Thank you, Michael, for sharing your insights with us today. Um, it was great to learn about CSIRO's role in this important work. Now, if you've just joined us, welcome to Climate Work Centre's first briefing room of 2024. Today, we're talking about the Renovation Pathway Project. I'm Michaela Morris, Head of Program Delivery at Climate Works. And we've just heard from Dr. Jill Armstrong and Michael Ambrose, who have laid out the challenges with Australia's existing housing stock and the details of the research analysis that underpins the Renovation Pathways project. Next up, we have Josh Danahay, who's going to dive into the project findings. Now, Josh is a project man in, uh, manager at Climate Works City's team, and he works on decarbonizing decarbonizing Australia's buildings. He previously worked in our sustainable economies team where he focused on renewable energy industrial precincts 
and their role in decarbonizing regional industries. Over to you, Josh. Thanks, Michaela. For many of us, our homes are our castle. As Jill and Michael have discussed, having a picture at the national level about how our homes can be made climate ready is hugely important. But Australia is a big place. What works in one situation might not necessarily fit another. Our homes are made from a range of construction materials and are built according to different architectural styles, depending on their location. And across Australia, we have regional areas and metropolitan areas, areas with hot, dry summers and areas with longer and cooler winters. And we have tropical climates and alpine climates. These factors highlight the need to uncover a detailed picture of the residential building stock and how the costs and benefits of energy performance upgrades differ in each jurisdiction. We also know from sectors such as industry and family policy that taking a place-based approach to policy making can promote better outcomes for communities. And given the complexities involved with decarbonising buildings, we wanted to take a more granular approach. So in addition to our Climate Ready Homes report, we've also broken down our data into state and territory findings. I'm going to talk to you today about some of the highlights we see in the data across the country and what this means for policymakers. But first, I want to take you through our modelling approach that Michael touched on just before. We rolled each home in the building stock model back to a low performance state, typical of an older home, with gas heating, minimal ceiling insulation and poor air tightness. We then applied three bundles of energy performance upgrades to the building's thermal shell, based on that research by RMIT and Race for 2030, which ranged in price from around $14,000 up to about $45,000 in total for each package. These upgrades switched gas space conditioning to an efficient electric heat pump, improved insulation and air tightness, and at the climate ready level included double glazing and heat recovery ventilation. In addition to improving the thermal shell, we also switched from gas to electric for cooking and hot water appliances. And finally, we calculated the capacity needed for a rooftop solar unit to power the home's remaining energy use. Now, let's take a look at some key findings we see on a per dwelling basis for detached houses, the most common type of home in Australia. And of course, at ClimateWorks, our focus is on reducing emissions. So what happens to emissions arising from each house when we undertake upgrades to a low performing home? Well, what we see is that undertaking the climate ready upgrades maximizes the potential emission savings. And this is particularly the case in states with colder winters. In Victoria and Tasmania, for example, the switch from gas heating to an electric heat pump and improvements to the thermal shell are responsible for a reduction of up to 2.9 tonnes of carbon emissions annually per dwelling. To put that in perspective, that's about the equivalent emissions from driving 27 times between Melbourne and Sydney. And moving north to Queensland, climate ready upgrades are responsible for 0.6 tonnes of carbon emission reductions. And this is a bit more than the contribution from electrifying hot water and cooking appliances, which contributes just under 0.5 tonnes of emissions reductions annually. While in Western Australia, climate ready upgrades contribute reductions of 1.1 tonnes of carbon emissions and electrifying hot water and cooking contributes around 0.7 tonnes. And as Michaela and Jill foreshadowed earlier, there isn't just an impact on emissions. According to the data, climate ready upgrades can benefit the energy transition by reducing peak demand. Looking at detached houses again, in Tasmania and Victoria, we see a reduction in peak demand of around six kilowatts per dwelling, around the same amount of energy as a two-star rated clothes dryer. While in New South Wales and South Australia, we see a reduction of between four and just over 4.5 kilowatts per dwelling. About the same energy used by one or two fridges in a day, depending on how energy efficient your fridge is. Now, as Jill spoke about, we all know there's also a cost of living crisis going on. So can these upgrades put money back in people's pockets? Well, our research shows that upgrades can help people across the country save on their energy bills. So let's look at the annual bill savings across the country for occupants of detached houses. People living in the Northern Territory could save up to $1,000, while Western Australians stand to save up to $1,500. 
those in Queensland and New South Wales could save over $2,000, while Victorians and South Australians could save up to $2,700 annually. Meanwhile, people living in Tasmania and the ACT could save the most at $3,100 and $4,700 respectively. So the big question is, how do we get our existing housing stock upgraded? What role is there for policy in this area? Well, we know there's not just one silver bullet. However, there is an excellent opportunity for the Australian government to set a long-term strategy to reduce emissions from the residential building sector in line with a 1.5 degree trajectory that includes improving the energy performance of existing housing, especially important, as we heard earlier, given that most of the houses that will be standing in 2050 have already been built. We see the built environment sectoral plan and the update to the trajectory for low energy buildings as two key levers that are being worked on this year and which can complement the government's upcoming national energy performance strategy. Meanwhile, much of the on-ground policy action sits with the states and territories. Here, we see the need for a suite of coordinated policies. This would include mandatory disclosure of home energy efficiency ratings at point of sale or lease, increased minimum energy efficiency standards for rentals, and phasing out gas use in homes, as well as prioritisation of financial support for vulnerable households and First Nations housing, in order to ensure those that can least afford to undertake upgrades aren't left behind in the transition. Back to you, Michaela. Thank you, Josh. Um, these average cost saving projections really speak for themselves. Um, we're now going to open the floor for questions. So let's welcome back our other two speakers so we can kick off the discussion. Now, um, you would recall that we invited you to submit questions through the Q&A bot button at the bottom of your screen. And whilst you're doing that, um, I'll start us off with some questions that have been submitted ahead of the session. And I might start with you, Josh, um, since you've just spoken. Now, um, when you multiply the costs for these performance upgrades across Australia's housing stock, it's quite a large sum of money. Um, do you see a role for the finance sector or large scale investors to facilitate these upgrades at scale? Yeah, thanks, Michaela. It is a good question. And I think when you're looking at Per dwelling level, it's a um, reasonable amount of money. And then when you multiply that across the housing stock, you know, you're talking large sums of money. Uh, and while the work that we've been doing in renovation pathways is really focused on um, that individual residential building level and the analysis from those energy upgrades, um, out there in the wider world, there's also been a lot of movement in the sustainable finance sector um, and particularly around climate related financial disclosures. Um, so these are, are soon going to see banks and other large scale institutional businesses needing to um, start reporting on their scope three missions, um, which for some of them will include residential property portfolios. Um, and this is something that we see is um, driving the need for investors really to start looking at ways to improve their emissions portfolios um, and the, the, uh, the profile of their assets. Um, and this kind of baseline can really start to kickstart some of those other um, financial incentives that we see being uh, suggested out in the market, like tax concessions, um, uh, financing um, packaging for um, upgrades as houses get sold and the like. So yeah, very good question. Thank you. Yeah, and that's also the connection to corporate net zero targets no? for those financial institutions. Um, very interesting. Now over to you, Jill. You mentioned um, supporting vulnerable households as a priority. Where would you start that? Yeah, so I'd start with all vulnerable households, particularly because we need to kickstart the supply chain and boost the workforce. So starting here with vulnerable households means that everyone benefits from that, not just the households themselves that are you know, the starting point, but by getting that supply chain up and running, making things a little bit cheaper, getting everyone trained up and to upscale across all homes um, is the task that's ahead of us. And for me, the vulnerable households in the worst performing homes are the place to start because by solving those problems um, in the worst performing homes, then you're going to see the biggest benefits as well. You're going to see the, uh, the biggest reduction in emissions, but also the comfort level going from a really you know, poor place to being much, much higher for those occupants. Okay. And in addition to those most vulnerable households, how much of the current stock would you re recommend to be renovated? 
um, and how much emissions could be then saved if we were to achieve that level of renovation? Well, we we there is a small gap in the um, data that no one can fill. The data just isn't available that details exactly how many homes are at the low performing level. We know there's lots of small scale studies done on, say, Victoria or uh, WA, uh, those pieces of research, but they don't give that national picture. So we're recommending if we start with the worst performing homes with the, the biggest budget that we can, we can have for uh, vulnerable households, then that's going to be the best place. If we just look at, say, 10% of homes and do the 10% that is the worst performing, then that is a really good um, starting point. Mm -hmm. So what the what the program really established is the archetypes, um, but we don't have the exact numbers and distribution in every state, and so we can't aggregate up the, the findings, is that? We do have the archetypes and we do have the distribution of them, but we're not quite sure exactly the number of each of those that are um, low performing. And there's that's still a data gap for everyone to tackle with. The archetypes I would recommend are those detached dwellings in particular, the types that we showed on the slide, they're the worst performing and the most prevalent. So those homes are the point to start on. Okay, thank you. Um, now over to Michael, we had a question from the audience. Um, someone has been doing some energy assessments in New South Wales with the scorecard program. Yeah. So older homes already have some envelope improvements done as you know, DYI jobs. Um, is that considered in the database? Do you have any visibility on on those DYI improvements? No, this is this is mm -hmm. part of the challenge that uh, this type these types of uh, renovation work that is done uh, on existing homes uh, is not captured in any way. This is why we had to create this this pseudo uh, database because one doesn't one doesn't exist. Certainly, things like the scorecard, and then there's been pushes. Uh, to for uh, in, in ACT we have a there is a mandatory disclosure uh, program in the ACT so at time of sale or lease uh, a house has to uh, get a, a rating done uh, if that was rolled out uh, nationally uh, something like like that that would go an enormous way to uh, creating this data set of what does the actual as Jill mentioned you know trying to actually target where are these actual homes that are really poorly performing where are they um that's that's one of the big challenges so uh, so so certainly at the, at the moment things like what's captured in uh, the scorecard assessments no we don't have uh, access to that data we'd love to have it but we don't have it at this stage yeah okay well there's always more to be done now <laughs> um now probably a follow-up question from this michael um did you consider home ownership levels um when determining in the project does it make a difference whether the the, the house is owner occupied or it's look it's, 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 it's yeah look it's it's a good question uh, and and certainly uh, we we know from other studies that uh, rental properties tend to be poorer performing uh, than owner owner occupied uh, properties and certainly the opportunities that exist uh, for uh, renters to what what measures they can take themselves uh, on those properties that they're renting uh, is is much more limited. Uh, than, uh, than what you can do if you actually uh, own the house uh, yourself. We didn't specifically uh, look at the, uh, the type of ownership uh, of, of, of the properties, um, but we do know that uh, it, you know, by and large that our rental properties are, are tend to be at the lower end uh, of the star rating scale. Okay, thank you. Now, um, Josh, we have a question for you. Um, the the audience is pointing out that obviously the, the saving opportunities in the ACT were so much higher than in the other states. Could you speak a little bit um, to why that is? What's the, what's the underlying reason for that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a couple of things that go into that. And firstly, um, when you're looking at the differences across Australia, a lot of the differences come down to uh, the climate zones that the home uh, is located in. And um, given that we have quite large states and territories, um, places like New South Wales or Western Australia, for example, have quite a few climate zones that will fit into them. And then when you, when you aggregate that up um, to a, a state by state um, level, they, uh, to an extent, can offset each other depending on um, the location, whereas the ACT falls within one climate zone in the data. So you're really kind of looking at a, at a um, smaller 
sample size and smaller um, uh, area when you're looking at that um, outcome, um, particularly when you're, you're considering that we're looking at just the low performing stage. And as, as Michael and Jill mentioned, uh, we haven't nailed down exactly how many of those houses in the ACT data would be at the low performing stage. Um, but you also get quite um, quite big temperature extremes in the ACT as well. So often people will be um, rugged up in winter. I know we have a few um, people that are uh, uh, based in Canberra uh, at Climate Works, and often you'll see them rugged up in big parkers over the winter. Um, so that goes to the amount of um, energy use in, in heating, particularly is, is where you're getting most of those results uh, coming through. Great, thank you. Um, we're getting a question about heat pumps for hot water heating. Um, the audience points, points out that they seem still very expensive. Um, now, in when you identified those different upgrades, um, did you speak to manufacturers and, and did you consider di different types of appliances? Um, it's probably a question for both Josh and, and Jill. Yeah, hi, I can, I can say this one. Um, we um, we did speak to industry. Um, we did look at the kind of typical appliances that are available. Um, but we know as a general principle that heat pumps are, um, you know, a great energy efficient product. There are so many on the market that it was kind of out of scope to go through every, every different kind of heat pump by every different manufacturer. So we took advice from uh, Michael at CSIRO and uh, the strategy policy research to define a common one, the most popular um, purchased heat pumps in the um, across all of um, retrofitting. And that's the one that we used and priced to put into the system. Thank you. Um, now, maybe let's talk a little bit about the anticipated challenges and barriers to scaling this up. So we just talked, you know, obviously cost challenges and um, some data issues. Um, what else is there? So what are the challenges and barriers to scaling up efforts to make Australian homes climate ready and how can these be overcome? I'll probably send that question to each and every one of you and maybe you can answer from your respective viewpoint. We're starting with Jill since you just yeah. had to and mic to myself. Um, I think the biggest challenge is is that people have a very low expectation of what their house could be. I think that that's uh, this understanding of where your house is performing at the moment is just not there. You don't know whether your you know your home is at A grade or a, an F grade, and then you don't know how that will feel when you start to do those improvements. Because I think if people understood that adding some of the upgrades to their homes, how it will impact them on a day-to-day -day basis, and also when the bill energy bills come in, then they would be rushing to do that um, if you know funding was there to do, to do the upgrades. Um, in our quick fix level, the, we've got quite a lot of um, really low cost, low tech ways of upgrading homes. Um, but if you went up a step to modest or climate ready, then you're really going to feel that difference as well. So it's about really educating people or people getting on board with the idea that you can swap out your appliances and have some energy efficiency um, improvements. But if you actually tackle the thermal shell, you're going to feel the difference in your property uh, throughout winter and summer. Over to you, Josh. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to quickly jump in as well. I've talked a little bit, of, I guess, about some of the financial barriers and ways that that could be overcome. But I think the other thing that uh, that comes to mind is that um, this is also a real skills challenge as well, making sure that uh, people actually undertaking the work to do these renovations um, and give advice to householders um, are, are well aware of the benefits of energy performance upgrades and. Um, how they benefit the homeowner, um, what uh, particular items to be using, how it fits in um, for the particular house and construction and, um, and and climate zone as well. So hopefully this research sort of goes a little bit of the, the way to um, tackling that issue. But I think um, it, as it is 
in many aspects of, uh, of climate change is just really considering um, the skills aspect and, and uh, making sure that workers are they're trained and there's enough of them um, to undertake what we need. Thank you. Um, and Michael, do you have... Yes, I might as well chip in a, a little bit as well. Uh, so I, I think consumer awareness um, and we, we've seen, uh, and so things like, when I mentioned uh, the scorecard uh, program and having having systems that allow people to actually understand where where does their home uh, um, actually actually sit uh, as far as energy efficiency goes is a really important step. And we we know uh, for the ACT, for example, I did mention it that, that they have this uh, mandatory disclosure uh, program. Those types of programs where it actually becomes uh, just part of the the normal conversation when we're looking at homes and buying homes that the energy efficiency. Uh, of, of that property is just another one of those common things that is uh, considered uh, when when you're looking looking at properties and knowing what to do. Uh, so if you do, there's nothing, nothing wrong with buying uh, a, an, old, an old home, but having that knowledge about, okay, uh, I know that it's going to be poorly performing. Here are the things that I, that I can do to undertake to improve its performance. I think that's really critical because a lot of people just are simply uh, not aware uh, of uh, the energy costs that might come with uh, buying some of these older homes. Yeah, which then means they can't factor that into their buying decision. Um, and That's right. Problem. And we know in the ACT uh, that that does have a monetary Im impact uh, on, on a property. So uh, research work that's been done up there uh, has shown that uh, homes uh, with higher uh, energy efficiency uh, ratings uh, actually uh, get a uh, sell for a higher a higher price. Uh, so we, we know that there uh, there is a, a financial um, benefit associated with making your homes more energy efficient as well. Brilliant. That was also one of the questions from the audience. So there is already some research in states where we have mandatory disclosure. Um, but only, only, the AC, only the ACT uh, where, the, where that where that uh, occurs. But uh, yes, yeah, so and, and look, it's it's always tricky with this. It's, it, you know, we try and say with all, all keeping all other things are uh, equal, but certainly the the evidence that's come up from the research work that's been done there shows that there is there is a link uh, between energy efficiency and uh, the the sale price uh, of of a property. So it, it is tricky if you're a home owner that's that is planning to sell you know that that investment um in in improving its energy efficiency it will be something that, that not only will you recoup it as you, you, with your running costs but when you come to eventually uh, sell that home it, it'll be recouped uh there as in in the sale price uh as well so it's it's a it's a, it's a good thing to do yeah for more than for many reasons um we had another follow-up questions on apartments. Um, someone pointed out that some of them don't even have sufficient electricity coming into their blocks. So there's some, you know, um, so, some inherent barriers um, and that therefore you, it's, it's harder to replace gas heaters and cookers. Um, what are your findings specifically for apartment blocks, especially those that are tenanted out? Is there anything specific that apply to those? Um, I don't know who wants to take that question first. Is that... Yeah, I can start, Michaela. Yeah, um, it's the same upgrade package because we've gone down to basic principles about how homes lose energy or gain too much of the solar radiation. Um, but we found that, um, well, it, it was really backing up what we already knew and the data definitely showed us that apartments are actually, most apartments are um, more efficient than detached dwellings because they've got less exposure to the outside elements. They're often lagged below and above with another apartment and to the sides. So apartments are perhaps on the more efficient side when we look across the whole housing stock. But upgrading the apartments, particularly the worst ones, which are going to be the ones with the most amount of exposure. So we're talking top floor with no apartment above it. We're talking a corner apartments. We're talking apartments that are facing directly into um, the sun, the north, and also the afternoon sun in the west. So those ones are the ones to really focus down on. If you've, you're in one of those apartments, do do have a think about the upgrade packages that we're recommending and do have a look at what policies coming in to support you in doing that. And Michaela, I might just chip in. After. There are 
other unique challenges uh, for apartments, particularly um, around those common common areas and, th and those um, uh, facilities that are uh, are given you know, as part of the um, uh, the common the common area. So if if, if it's got a centralised hot water system, or well, some of them even have centralised um, heating and cooling uh, systems, uh, that can be challenging. Of course, it's you know it's, it's often out of the control of an individual apartment uh, owner to do anything uh, about the centralised hot, hot water service. Um, but uh, so we, we we are aware of the challenges, the unique challenges that come uh, with uh, with apartment uh, ownership. But as Jill pointed out, generally speaking, apartments do start at a, at a slightly better at, at a slightly better level as far as thermal efficiency goes. And there still are upgrades that can be done within the apartments themselves that can improve its its efficiency, particularly on the glazing side of things. So improvements to glazing. It's not necessarily replacing glazing, but putting uh, protecting. Uh, films or, or curtains across uh, those, particularly if it's a west-facing uh, windows that are in apartments, that, that can be uh, quite effective. Thank you, Michael. I was not across that, so that's really interesting about apartments. Um, maybe whilst we're speaking about um, what what individual home owners or renters could do, um, a question from the audience relates to, is there any modeling and assumptions publicly available for people to calculate the impact of home upgrades that they might be considering? So do we have this data and this information available to people take action and implement it actually? It's it's a great question. Uh, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like something I would, uh, I, I would love to build actually. Uh, we, we are... We are doing another project in in uh, CSIRO uh, that is is looking at uh, putting out simple simple tools, a bit bit like uh, you have uh, loan calculators uh, on um, you know the bank sites for working out your loan, um, uh, the best loan deal you can get. Same sort of same sort of idea. Uh, so we have a, a, a system called Rapid Rate that. Uh, we are going to be to be rolling out. And the idea is just with a very few simple um, parameters that you can just determine yourself from from your home, you know, the age and how big the home is, and things like that. And that'll give you an estimate of where the um, of, of what of the star rating of, of the home would be. And we're hoping to also build in into that uh, then some simple and fairly generic uh, upgrade options that might be uh, available for for a property that we're at rate. Right. So it it's a tool is coming. <laughs> it's on the it's on our agenda. So keep it keep an eye out for it. Brilliant. So the answer is not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we've got time for two more questions, so we'll I'll pick something here. Um, maybe also on the implementation side, there was a question about um, community groups that are already taking steps or taking it up themselves to develop programs that help households upgrade and retrofit, um, deciding examples of electri uh, Electrify Australia, Geelong Sustainability, and so on. Um, what can we do to support these groups in developing such programs, and is there any services that you can point us to? Um, maybe start with Jill, if that's something you want to answer. Yeah, so each state and territory, depending on where the question's being asked, has got different upgrade policy uh, and supports to do that. So I really recommend going to your own state and territory's policy page for upgrading existing buildings. Um, but I'd also then also go to local council for resources as well. There's different uh, set situations depending on where those homes actually exist and the recommendations for the upgrade package, of course, um, the benefits that you get depends on the climate zone that you're sitting in as well. But there, is, there are resources. It's perhaps a little, just a little bit overwhelming because there is a lot of resources out there and you've got to translate it to your, to your home, what policy is available for your home. Mm. And yeah. as Jill as Jill mentioned, you know it 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 varies. There are different programs and incentives and rebates that are available, but they all vary from state to state. So you really do have to uh, go on a bit of a, a, a fishing expedition uh, to find uh, what is available. And certainly, groups like John Sustainability were actually doing um, as part of a, a race, another uh, different race twenty thirty program. We're working with John Sustainability, and so those local community groups are another 
great way to tap into uh, their knowledge base and know what is going to be available uh, for you and what what opportunities, what rebates could be could be available. It does vary from state to state. And can I just chip in as well? Like one of the most exciting ones for me is in Victoria, the range of different policy kind of incentives to help you. The Victorian one was to cap the disconnection fee to get off gas and to cap it at $200. Previous to that, it was around 15 to 1800 just to ask the gas company to turn the gas off at your meter. So there's everything from insulation packages, different light fittings to appliances, upgrades, right down to capping legislation to cap gas disconnection. Yeah, thank you. That sounds rather fragmented. And I've been doing bits and pieces as well. Um, and I did disconnect from gas years ago, and I still have the the, the meter readers coming, sending me notes that um, they couldn't access my meter, and I haven't had a meter in eight years. So I, I think the system is probably not quite um, set up for gas disconnections yet. So good to hear that there's movement. Um, we're almost at time. So I will throw one last question, question into the group. Um, taking us probably a little bit more on a bird's eye perspective, um, looking at international best practice or case studies from other countries that Australia could draw inspiration from in terms of advancing climate ready housing solutions and upgrades. So maybe we'll do a quick last fire round um, if, if each and everyone could, could mention what they know from an international best practice or what Australia could aspire to. Maybe Jill start with you and then we'll take the, the tour. But there's quite a few countries with mandatory energy efficiency disclosure programs and getting that education up and running and getting visibility on what, how your home is pre performing um, is the starting point for me. So I would look to the EU, to the UK, that have got these uh, disclosure programs in place. Get that data out there. Thank you. Um, Josh, do you want to add anything? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, the, yeah, a lot of great work going on in the EU in terms of um, uh, the rating systems and, and the upgrades themselves, but also just wanted to um, draw attention to um, uh, in America with the Inflation Reduction Act and some of the tax concessions that have been um, put forward in that for energy efficiency is definitely something that we could learn from um, here in Australia. Great, thank you. And Michael, I'll hand over to you. Yes, well, I was going to mention the the uh, the US programs as well. That's it's uh, it's a phenomenal uh, amount of money uh, that has been put in in into that uh, program, and um, it'd be lovely to see something uh, like that replicated here. Uh, and and the European Union countries are also, you know, they're in any many ways they they are miles ahead of us. Although I have to say, as far as our um, the actual modelling itself, the thermal modelling that we do we do do. Uh, here in Australia, it that is one of the most sophisticated um, in in the world. So we certainly have uh, the uh, the skills and the knowledge and and the tools uh, of, available for it all. So it, it it comes down to the uh, uh, the political will, perhaps, to to actually uh, implement it all. Yeah, to catch up. Well, it sounds like we're we've got the information we need, um, and that brings us to the end of our discussion today. Thank you so much to our speakers, Jill, Michael, Josh. It was a pleasure having you here today. Um, and obviously uh, to also to our team behind the scenes, Sophie Stefanakis, Alison Curtin and Taya Horn Green, really appreciate your technical support and the wise um, support with the questions. Um, now, as Climate Works is a philanthropically funded organization, we extend our heartfelt appreciation to the funders of the Renovation Pathways Project, Boundless Earth, the Paul Ramsey Foundation, Energy Consumers Australia, um, and also the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. Their support made this work possible, and we warmly welcome new partners to join us in bridging the gap between research and action that improves the climate, cities, and homes um, in which we live. You can find out more about our work and catch up on this um, and previous briefing rooms at climateworkcenter.org. We will send through a recording from this session, um, as well as links to the resources discussed. So keep an eye um, out for your inbox in the next couple of days we'll, that will come through. Um, the final report for this project is titled Climate Ready Residential Buildings, Building the Case um, for, renovate, for a Renovation Wave in Australia. And you will also find this report um, and the supplementing links on the Climate Work Centre website. The next briefing room will be in May and we hope you can join us. More information for that session will be available soon. Um, thank you so much for joining us. See you next time. Have a good afternoon.